I hate two things. One is after dinner speaking and opening up a conference. I hate it. <laughs> Whew. Um, so in 2010, I had this extraordinary honor um, of doing a TED talk and sharing the stage with names that you kind of make your eyes water. Um, the Sheryl Sandbergs, the Hillary Clintons, the Donna Karens, you know, that kind of thing. And I was towards the end. And what nobody knew at the time was actually it was the least time I should have been standing on a stage. From the outside looking in, I looked like my life was working marvelously. It was absolutely falling apart. And I was terrified. Um, and as I was going onto the stage, within five minutes, a wonderful man sent me a text and he said, all you need to do is be you. That man has now subsequently become my husband. <laughs> um, anyway, halfway through my TED talk, I, I froze. And in freezing, I remember going, oh my God, the text message. And so I just basically said to the audience, this is me. I think the bravest thing any of us can do is truly to be ourselves, completely and entirely ourselves. Whether that's to stop or go, whether it's yes or no, whether whatever. And it's not in the most horrific traumas or the greatest disasters that actually bravery is required. It's in the everyday. It's as you came out of your houses today. For me, being brave is being entirely authentically yourself. And that is the work that we will put in not only as humans, but in our professional work. And how, particularly in the field that you're in, in marketing, brand, creative communication, it requires you to say the things that are real. And I may be braver, stronger, truer now than I was in 2010, when I have never been so vulnerable. And I thought brave was to be strong and to never give in and never give up. But actually, in that 2010 talk that went viral, I realized that the greatest courageous act I had done was to let my knees wobble in front of a stage. And I might be a little braver now, but I am telling you, you can hear the shake in my voice. I'm scared this morning. I'm scared of letting Gemma down. I'm scared because you are the room of the people that I want more than anything else in the world, because I believe you're the game changers. Not governments, not CEOs, not even charities. I actually believe in the work that I do, it's you. So what happens if I'm not good enough today? And that's a real thing to say, but I could come in here and I could do juggle and I'll do the act, but that's the truth. I want you to believe in what I see. I'm in the middle of an inclusion revolution. I don't believe in a la carte inclusion. I don't believe any company in the world can say they are inclusive or equal or believe in equality if we're willing to leave the 1.3 billion people in the world who happen to have a disability outside business. That 1.3 billion people is not a them or an us. Every single one of us in our lifetime are going to experience disability, every single one of us. And yet we've never had a Bono for disability, nor did we ever have a Sheryl Sandberg. And why not? No human being should be defined by a medical condition. But people with disabilities, 1.3 billion currently now, 80% acquired between the ages of 18 and 64. In this room alone, at least 10% of you in the next five years. And the point of it is, we're not necessarily included because I don't think business sees the extraordinary opportunity. Disability, I believe, is the new green. I totally believe dragging it from the edges right into the mainstream of business. Business is the most powerful force on this planet. You can make change happen. You've proved it a thousand times before, and particularly brands. Disability is intersection. It's going to happen to every single one of us. I think it's the new green because it's a return on investment on brand, the attraction and retention of next generation talent, and access to a new market, which is currently a trillion. No charity there. And the only way that I think that we can do this is get the world's greatest leaders, like the Sheryl Sandbergs, the greatest brands, like the Nikes, whether you like them or not to be brave, and the greatest platforms, and go out and say, here we are, do business with us. So you are the biggest and the most important room, and I can't thank Gemma enough for letting me stand here. But I wouldn't be here again if it wasn't for one key thing that happened just under two years ago. My wonderful father is a man called Jerry Casey. He's six foot six, size 15 feet, like we are talking massive. 
And he died very suddenly two years ago. And he was the one who had always said, be yourself, and I'm not gonna use bad language, and bleep the bastards. Um, he always wanted us to be brave and courageous. In his passing, it was actually where I finally found the courage to bring the new green, to create a global inclusion revolution, to put disability on the business leadership agenda. It has been an incredible journey since his death. In that first year that you go around, bits of you not right, you feel like you've been completely transformed. And yet, in that pain, somehow, somehow, the passion that I have for this work, that we can all belong as ourselves. This isn't a call out for disability inclusion, it's a call out for human inclusion. If we get disability right, we get it right for everyone. And despite the pain and the sorrow and the lack of confidence that comes with grief, this passion that burned so much inside me to finish this business that I started off 18 years ago. And so I'm going to do something right now to tell you how I got through that and what for me being brave is. And the key thing that I hope that you're gonna hold with you all the way through the day as you see all the speakers come up. So I'm gonna ask the lights to be shut down if that's okay. I love a bit of dark. No kissing now in the back row. So I want you, for those of you who ever really get scared, the next time you're scared, the next time you're heartbroken, the next time that you don't think that you're good enough, sometimes a lot of us look up at the stars and they're like diamonds in the sky. And there it's dark, but in those diamonds, you see them. See the diamond sitting on your lap. I call this phosphorus. For those of you who have been lucky enough to swim in the Aegean Sea or oceans around the world where phosphorus exists, it's like the diamonds fell into the sea. And if you move your hands around and you shake, the sea starts to light up with electricity. In this room of darkness right now, the greatest power is that light that you hold in your hand. To be brave is to fully embrace yourself and bring that into the work you do. It's not to ignore the bits of yourself. And when we're brave, all those lanyards light up and the world is genuinely a better place for everyone. So can we bring those lights up again? And why do I care so much? This phosphorus story has very, three very quick acts. One is, act one, labels are for jam jars. Act two is, when you lose it all magnificently. And act three is, wings. So, <laughs> labels are for jam jars. 17 years old, and this is what was on the TED talk, I had had three dreams. One was to be Mowgli from the Jungle Book, the other was to be a cowgirl, and the other was to be a biker chick, hence the leather. Um, and my father, the famous Sherry Casey, gave me a driving lesson for my birthday so I could go off and get my motorbike license. Woohoo! Listening to Led Zeppelin in my helmet. It was on that birthday, completely unexpected to me, that I found out I wouldn't be on a motorbike except Pillion. On my 17th birthday, I found out I have been since birth, I am now, but even worse, registered blind. And I know you're probably looking at me going, she's wearing heels, that's bullshit. Can I just say, when did being visually impaired stop you wanting to have great shoes? Because it makes your ass look better, right? So the thing is, you also probably don't believe me, I can promise you in my bag there's a white stick, okay? With a big bauble at the end of it. And I use that to skip queues in airports and to get the attention I need for whatever I need. I would have used it in the queues getting in here today. <laughs> you gotta always work with what you got, right? But let me explain to you because I know you don't believe me. I actually, well, like, you can't see it with the lights, but beyond my hand, is just a world of Vaseline. It's particularly difficult when you're in crowds because I don't really know the difference between a man and woman. I can smell the difference. But what I can definitely tell you, which my husband is absolutely thrilled about because he's bald and very pink. He looks like George Clooney to me. You don't get to be better looking, right? <laughs> he has the biggest eager chip of his life. But I really can't see the difference between the gents and the ladies' toilets is a triangle, for God's sake, and they're getting more smaller and smaller. So bring on toilets for everyone, unisex toilets, love it. I have got arrested because I got into a car, like a car, a personal car, thinking it was a taxi. I've gone onto the wrong planes before security got tough. I think I look 26, I don't, I'm 47, but Botox is standing three feet away from the mirror. It is a blur. So I'm gonna come up and see you a bit. 
She, can she do steps and heels? The filming people hate me right now. Okay, yes, I can. But anyway, the reason I want to kind of stand close to you is because I can feel you better. That's my energy. So I found out at 17 years old, I would never, you know, be going on a motorbike. And everybody imagines I was devastated. And can I also tell you, it wasn't an accident. My mother and my father made a decision when I was three and a half years old, where they're going to go me, send me to school, would they send me to a visually impaired school or a normal school? And Jerry being Jerry, quite scary, he just went, we do not believe she should have a label. It will limit her belief in her life. And therefore, they sent me to school and brought me up as a sighted child with a pair of fake glasses. Labels are jam jars. They are not for human beings. And he wanted my wings to be the biggest they could ever be and did not want them clipped. So I went into school thinking other kids with glasses are exactly the same as me. I was shite at ball sports because I couldn't see anything. The other thing nobody ever tells you is your balance is completely off. Kissing boys are amazing because everybody was beautiful until you kind of got that close. But um, <laughs> the one thing my dad did do, knowing that I couldn't see very well, right? He had this great idea, and this is one of my big things about being brave, is your intuition fearlessly, fearlessly believing in your intuition. That light that I asked you to hold, that is your spirit and your intuition. And this is how I learned it. He knew I couldn't do all the things like hit tennis balls and stuff. And so the sport that he introduced me to was sailing. And the shore of Loch Derg, which is a beautiful lake in Ireland, with my mom standing beside him, he put a life jacket on me. I'd never sailed before. And he said, I want you to close your eyes now, Caroline, and feel where the sun is and feel the wind in your face. My mother was standing beside him and they were having a massive row, right? Like she did not approve of this at all. <laughs> and so he puts me in this tiny little boat and he gets in a motorboat and he goes out in the lake and he goes round and round. He releases my sailing boat and he goes, sail home. <laughs> How many of you are parents? Like this is really not a good situation, right? <laughs> Lots of combinations here. And I was like, well, I don't know how to sail. I don't know where home is. And he said, work it out. Feel your way home. I want you to close your eyes now and feel the wind in your face and feel it, the difference from where you are in the boat to the shore. So I did get home, but nothing to do with the bloody wind in my face. It was my mother screaming and shouting. <laughs> I just follow the sign. But it's that wind in your face that I ask and invite you to think about today as you professionally stand up, as you personally emerge. So at 17, when I found out that I was visually impaired, you know what? I didn't want it. It was my first act of conscious discrimination. I did not want the label disability because I thought my life would be small and I wanted to belong. I wanted to belong. I wanted to be me and all those crazy dreams. And though I knew I may never be able to drive, I didn't want my life to be small, which is what I imagined disability would do. And so for 11 years, I hid it. Like, I mean, I hid it well. And I was an archeologist. I mean, it's the stupidest thing for a visually impaired or blind person to do. I went traveling across Australia. I tried to get my driving license in Australia, not a hope because I couldn't see the car. They were asking me to read the reg on. I did uh, everything you can do. I came back, I was a masseuse of the good kind. Then I went into business, then I went to landscaping. Oh, hello. Then I went back to do masters in business. And can I just say one great piece of news for people who are visually impaired, a great exam technique called a memory. And I got it first and everybody wanted to go to the big companies in the world, the graduate re recruitment programs. And in Ireland at that time, everybody wanted to work for Accenture. The Egypts employed me. I had registered blind doing my masters, I just like to point out, but never telling anybody because I wanted the free bus pass because I'd run out of cash. I was two and a half years with Accenture before I came out of the closet. And I laughingly say, what does that say to you about management consultants? But anyway, <laughs> I loved my time in Accenture. I'm very proud to be an alum because actually it was that which taught me the work that I do today. How I came out of the closet is after two and a half years for not asking for help, is how I had been brought up to be resilient and strong. And this is what being brave is, don't ask for help. You will survive. I eventually had to ask for help because my sight, the remaining sight I had, I had lost it temporarily. 30% was all I had left of the remaining sight. So we're talking a lot of accidents. 
And I went to see the HR manager and the HR manager, she was sitting down, she's wonderful. And she said, okay, what are you here for? And I said, the thing is, I can't see you right now. And she's going, don't worry, we reschedule. I'm like, no, this is not what I'm talking about. I don't see you at all. Where I ended up was in front of an eye doctor, which Accenture sent me to, to help me. And that eye doctor was another person, that knock on the door. Why are you so frightened to be herself? I'm not even going to look at your eyes because it's not your eyes. It's the six inches between your head. And he asked me as I left his office, what are your dreams, Caroline? Do you really feel like you're you? But I was successful, guys. I was. I had the job. I had the life. I had the house. You know, I was. But was I rocking and rolling inside? No, because it's exhausting trying to be somebody else. It's exhausting trying to be perfect. And for every one of you who's sitting there today with that in your head, just drop it, even just for today. We all spend our lives being ducks, calm on the outside, padding like shit underneath. So just in case that you might see that I have a voice that's wobbling today. Anyway, I left his office furious, uh, cursing in be beautiful Irish language, and went for a run along the beach, which I now do with a sighted guide, let me tell you. Then I wasn't, because I was too stubborn. And it's extraordinary what you can do when you can believe, right? But this time now, I no longer believed. I knew I had to dance with myself. I knew I had to be accountable, and I knew I had to have courage. And so as the fraud strip bear ran along the beach, I felt smash on a rock. It's very well known as snot rock. That rock was snot, tears, sweat, and I did not look good. And can I just tell you, I had no idea how to get off that rock. And how I got off that rock was one of my dreams. He had told me the doctor to take some time off to let my sight recover. And as I was sitting on that rock thinking, well, what would dad think about me right now in the Wednesday pouring rain in March in Ireland? One of those dreams came to me straight into my heart and it was Mowgli. <laughs> Mowgli saved my ass. It was nearly nine months later, I did become Mowgli from the Jungle Book by becoming the very first and only Western female elephant handler, Mahout, by trekking across India on an elephant. Now, can I just tell you, blind, blonde, albino, elephant handler, girl, it's a nice mix for the creative and media, right? Oh yeah, what was I doing? And because I'm Irish, Catholic and guilty, uh, the best thing to do, you couldn't just do it for yourself, enlightenment, we raise money. And one of the things I really wanted to do is understand about sight loss in India. With some of the money we raised, we pay for 6,000 cataract operations. 6,000 people got to see again because I got over myself. But one of the most important part of it is it gave me a platform to understand this issue of disability. It breaks my heart. I hate seeing somebody being bullied more than anything in the world. But there's one worse thing when you're not even worth visibility. There was a human rights report, 20, just came out in 2017. In the 20 years that have existed since the last one, the lives of people with disabilities have not improved enough. And I think it's because you guys aren't playing. And so when I came off that elephant, I set myself a goal to actually engage business in the extraordinary opportunity that exists here. And I spent a long time and we won awards and we were in Clinton Global Initiative, World Economic Forum and Davos and Ashoka's and everything else. And here we have this success, this extraordinary success. We are creating methodologies, a new narrative around disability, a different way to see it. And we are getting to business leadership. We, we, have, we have touched half a million leaders in that time. And the worst thing about success, the worst part of it all is you become afraid again because you have more to lose. And it's very true. Beware of success. And what was happening in that time, just as I was coming up to the TED talk, which is act two, if you're gonna fail, do it magnificently, is I had been hiding a personal crisis of extreme proportions that literally completely gutted my life. I was so busy trying to keep up and keep all the success going of our little organization and making change happen in the world that I forgot that I stood here again. Ruby's beautiful quote, I used to think I was clever and I tried to change the world. And now I am wise and I take care of myself. So true. So what I did after that 2010 talk, with everything that was crashing around, I shut down this gorgeous business, this award-winning business, because the management that had been put into it 
didn't hold the same values. Hardest thing I ever did. To shut it down and say, I failed. I wasn't her guardian enough. But if we aren't going to do it right, we're not going to do it at all. At the peak of my career. Act three, wings. So these wings, which I bought the Sunday before the Festival of Media, I'm wearing for Gemma. Wings is when people really believe in you, or the hands on your back. These wings are the wings of my father on my back, and they represent everything that I believe in. Freedom, the magic of possibility, and love and connection. They remind me that when I'm scared, that I am not alone. After I shut down my business, I was encouraged because it was a very valuable piece of methodology that we had created to sell it around the world. Everyone was like, Casey, do this, this, and this. And something in the gut of me was like, I don't know. And then dad died. And in his death, I found my courage. I found my bravery. I found the bravest ambition that I've ever had in my life. When my confidence wasn't high, I decided I would take that global stage for my inclusion revolution. Five days before he died, he pulled me so hard into him and he said, what are you waiting for? What did I bring you up for? Be yourself. Be yourself and the only way, Caroline, you will fail is by not beginning. And six weeks after he died, I started this inclusion revolution. Launched in August, hashtag valuable is asking for businesses around the world, it's not businesses, it's business leadership to recognize the value and the worth of this market which will touch us all. It wants to position business equally on the global business leadership agenda. It wants to find the Sheryl Sandbergs and the best, bravest brands and the greatest platforms to create the valuable 500, which is getting 500 global brands to put disability on their board agenda, accountable to leadership, and trigger a new movement. It was done with green. When Sheryl Sandberg shared that stage with me and Ted, it's not like we weren't speaking about women in business before, but when you've got this great personality, well-known figure, a fabulous brand and a great platform, shoo, magic. So why can't we not do it for 1.3 billion of us? And so in my brave madness to make this trip happen, I fulfilled a second dream. So when we launched Valuable, hashtag Valuable in August, guess what I decided to do? Right across Colombia on a horse to make it happen. Colombia, the greatest place to put business and disability. Oh, people were suspicious, but why not? Be unexpected. We reached 810 million people. I had to remortgage my house because 53 businesses said no, except for Channel 4 and Fossil. And of what I did, the most audacious thing in my life, speaking at One Young World, who are our greatest allies in this inclusion revolution because they desperately want to be seen and to be brought into our lives as who they are. They do not want discrimination. So I challenged them, stood in the audience, and you could just see David Jones and Kate Robinson trying to get me off the stage because they knew what I was going to do. But Cher was coming on after me, not a chance. So I was like, there has to be CEOs in this audience. And I stood there and I said, Get off the fence. I don't, I'm not inspiration porn. It's not inspiring just to be a person with a disability. I want one leader, one leader to stand here with me before I leave. Because our call to action was to find five Sheryl Sandbergs and Paul Pomans, 20 next generation leaders, and get on the main stage of Davos for 2019. So I stood there and said, where are you? <laughs> and suddenly the room moved. 12 stood but one stood and has stayed standing. And that was Paul Pullman. He does it for a lot of us. But you know the most extraordinary thing about leadership? Sometimes you do have to stand alone. And stand on what do you really believe in? I didn't expect him to call me two weeks later and say, right kiddo, how are you gonna make this happen? I'm like, I'm taking a rest. He said, no, you're now gonna start. I stand here Literally, a year ago, that I got a call from Paul. We are going to get disability and business on the main stage of Davos for the first time in the world. It will be historic and a landmark movement. We will be launching the Valuable 500 and the wings on my back are now Virgin Media and the Omnicom Group. I can afford a cup of coffee by December. 
The most extraordinary thing is standing with me is Janet Riccio of Omnicom, who has her own personal story on disability. It is Paul Pullman. It is Ben Van Vuren from Shell. It is Satya Nadella. It is Richard Branson. I'm not on my own. And I want to end by giving you the five things that I know. It doesn't matter if you're advocating for disability, trying to launch a grant, because you guys who are working with France, you are the parents. You are the Jerry and Valerie Casey of the Caroline. You must be brave. You must see the humanness in what you're doing because brands are just a creative human extension of who we are. So these are my things I want to say to you. For you, please be who you need to be in every part of you, even if that's the hard bit, because the greatest agony that any of us can imagine is having an untold story inside ourselves. And you are not defined, any of us, by your role, by your title, by your success, by your failure. You know what, every day we get a second chance. Every day we do. And it's glorious. It's bloody fantastic when you see the failure in the mirror and you know you're still standing. You're not defined by any of it. You have the greatest chance to walk out of here right now and do something bloody marvellous. And it doesn't need to be Richard Branson big. It can be anything that is true to you. The Hosier song that I'm loving at the moment it's called Nina Cries Power. Please put that in your ears and dance your boxes off in the coffee break because I'm inviting us to find our power in this crazy world. Yes, we need to be seen as unique and individual. Collectively, we have so much power. And one of the great lines is he says, it's not the wall, it's what's behind it. And that's us. That's us with all of this feeling that we have inside ourselves. And also my favorite Leonard Cohen, forget your perfect offering. It's the cracks where the light gets in. Oh, bloody hell, failure, bring it on. Dance with failure as you dance with success because it's only through that, actually, I think we grow, I think we stretch. And so what if a campaign is not the best campaign in the world? If I was worried about hashtag value being the best, which I hope it will be, I wouldn't have started. Feck it, it's an iteration of an iteration of an iteration. And I'm going to end with my gorgeous father who has been this hand on my back for some very strange reason, strongly in the last three or four weeks. Maybe it's his anniversary. We read him a line as he literally left the earth. There's a beautiful poem by David White. The last line of it is saying, follow your star. And after he died, or just as he was doing that, his last breaths, we said, follow your star, follow your star, follow your star. Follow your stars. And the one thing that we don't realize, except when you walk through this building, the pioneers for change were the unpopular. People like me are seen as the Egypt. People look at my lanyard and run away because the word disabilities on and there must be somebody cooler to talk to. But that's okay. When you're doing innovation, when you're trying to create something new, when you're trying to stand out, you've got to be brave. So my, my encouragement is how I will end is how I was here. Dangerous dreaming. You say I dare, dare to be brave? Well, I tell you the best way of living your life with all of those ups and downs is with your eyes wide open. And so this is the quote, all men dream, but not equally. There are those of us who dream at night, in the dusty recesses of our mind, and we wake in the day and we just think, oh, who am I? It's just vanity. But there's others of us in the world who dream in the day with our eyes wide, wide open. And we are dangerous. We are the dangerous people because we get things done. I cannot wait to see who the dangerous dreamers are who will be part of our tribe as we create an inclusion revolution for all. And my ask for all of you is don't live your life with daydreams, live it with dangerous. Thank you so very much.